We continue our study in all that Jesus taught. We're looking now at Matthew chapter 8. We were considering last, in the last episode, about these two demon-possessed people in the Gadara, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, who nobody could control in any way. And Jesus cast out the demons with a word, which I emphasized is so important. We have today many people saying they scream and we see them screaming and yelling and I've even seen people pulling people's hair to cast out demons and um, in such a dishonorable way and sometimes praying and fasting for days on end. Now, it's true. Jesus said that when the disciples could not cast out a demon in Matthew chapter 17. The disciples asked when the, they couldn't cast out a demon from a boy, the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 17, 19 and saying, why couldn't we cast out that demon? You know, Jesus just spoke one word and the demon came out, we read in Matthew 17, 18. One word. And then the disciples came and said, why couldn't we cast it out? And some people say, Jesus said, because you didn't pray and fast enough. No, read carefully. It was because your faith was little. When your faith is little, Matthew 17, 20, then you can cry and scream and pull people's hair and fast and pray and nothing will happen. Even days on end, nothing will happen. And the littleness of their faith was because, verse 21, they did not pray and fast. That means there was something in their life they had not sacrificed or given up. They didn't. Prayer is an expression of our helpless dependence upon God. Fasting is an expression of our willingness to deny ourselves certain earthly comforts, legitimate comforts, for the sake of the gospel. Are these things true in your life? Are you helplessly dependent upon God? which prayer symbolizes? Are you willing to give up the comforts, legitimate comforts of earth for the sake of God's kingdom? Are you willing to fast and pray? You'll have faith. And with that faith, you will not have to speak to a demon twice. Is there a single case in scripture where Jesus had to speak to a demon twice before the demon left? We read one case where Jesus prayed for a blind man and he was healed only partially. And then Jesus prayed again and he was healed fully. But that was to teach us something there. To teach us that when you're healed partially, you don't have to confess that you're healed fully. This is, uh, let me show that to you so that uh, you have no confusion on that issue. Because a lot of people are teaching that type of false teaching. In uh, We read about this man who was blind and he couldn't be healed. He was from Bethsaida. And uh, we, uh, the Lord spoke to him. This is Mark chapter 8. And when he said, when Jesus asked him in Mark eight twenty three, can you see anything after praying for him? He said, I'm seeing men like trees. Them walking about. He wasn't healed completely. Man, Jesus had spat on his eyes, laid hands on him, prayed for him, and he was not healed fully. That is amazing. There was never a case where Jesus touched somebody who was not healed fully. That was written, that incident was specifically planned for this 20th, 21st century, where people are told to confess that they're healed when they're not healed. Thank God for this incident where one person was prayed for and he was not healed. And what should he say? Should he say, I'm healed when he's not healed? No, he says, I can't, I'm not healed properly. I'm sorry, Lord, I know you prayed for me, but I'm not healed. I still confuse men and trees. And what did the Lord tell him? Did the Lord say, no, 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 no. I prayed for you, now just keep confessing that you're healed fully until it actually happens. He never said that. That would be telling a lie. And that is the lie that a lot of preachers are now going around telling 
people to say when the person is not healed, instead of the, pre instead of the preacher confessing his own unbelief, they're telling the poor man, sick man, to keep confessing he's healed. That's tragic. And so Jesus said, that's fine. I'll pray for you again. That's what we should do. When a person is sick, you prayed for him, he's not healed. Don't tell him to say he's healed. That's a lie because he's sick. Don't tell him he doesn't have any pain to say he's got no pain when he's suffering with pain. He must be honest and say, I'm sorry, preacher, but I still have pain. I still can't see. I'm still sick. Okay, we'll pray for you again. That's what Jesus said. He prayed for him again and he was healed clearly and he could see everything. So Jesus never asks us to confess a lie. Please remember that in passing. So Jesus always spoke a word whenever he cast out a demon. And that was enough. Because, particularly today, after Satan has been conquered, and every demon defeated on the cross, is it possible that there is a single demon or Satan himself who does not tremble at the name of Jesus? The Bible says, resist the devil, James 4 verse 7, he will flee from you. But before you do that, it says in that same verse, submit to God. Submit to God and resist the devil. Now, many people, when they quote that verse, they just quote the latter part of it. It's not, it doesn't say resist the devil. It says first submit to God. Make sure your whole life is submitted to God. Then resist the devil. And the promise is he will not just walk away. He will not run, but he will flee. Flee is a word which means running full speed. He's not going to be anywhere near you. He's going to disappear. That promise is true. If it is not, if it does not happen, it must be because either you didn't submit to God or you didn't resist the devil. Or when you resisted the devil, you did it without submitting to God. But if you submitted to God and you resisted the devil, it is impossible for that promise in James 4 not to be fulfilled. I mean, I'm telling you from more than 50 years of experience, I've seen that. Wherever I submit to God and resist the devil, he flees. And so when you speak to a demon who's already been conquered on Calvary's cross, one word is enough. There's no need to scream. There's no need to yell. I remember once whispering under my breath because I didn't want to disturb the whole congregation. And a demon-possessed person 30, 40 feet away obeyed the command. I remember another time when uh, a demon-possessed person looked in a scary way at me. I mean, try to scare me, the fierce face. And I was taken aback for a moment and I asked myself this question just to confirm my own faith and reaffirm it. This demon that's inside this person, was it one of those that escaped at Calvary? Or was he conquered? And I said, he was conquered. Every single demon was conquered in Calvary. So I spoke to that demon to get out and he left. In every single case, I believe the word of Jesus that you don't need to speak to any demon-possessed person more than once to cast out the demon, not because of what you are, but because of the authority that there is in the name of Jesus Christ and because you believe that every demon in hell, every demon, in, uh, every demon in, uh, and Satan himself were all defeated on the cross. They're not in hell, they're in the heavenlies. Were defeated on the cross and you have authority over them. If your life is clean, they're anointed to the Holy Spirit, the devil has to listen to your word when you cast out a demon. And if you seek to do that, and any believer can do that, who's anointed with the Holy Spirit and whose life is clean and who believes God's word. And when you do that, if that demon does not leave, then I know what you need to Then I'll tell you what you've got to do. You've got to go and pray and fast and seek God and ask like the disciples, why couldn't we cast it out? And the Lord will say, show you something in your life that needs to be set right. Maybe it's unbelief. Maybe it's something else. But there's no need to continue there, you know, praying and praying for hours and hours and hours and torturing everybody else and that poor demon-possessed man while you're trying to struggle to cast the demon out. This is the type of crazy thing that's going on in a lot of Christendom. So I just want to clear that and say, let's follow the example of Jesus. He said, be gone, Matthew 8, 32. One word, like it says in Matthew 8, 16, he cast out the demons, the spirits with one word, be gone. That's it. 
And the other question we can ask ourselves here is, why did God allow these demons to go into these 2,000 pigs, or how many there were there, into this herd of swine, and all the swine went into the sea, jumped over the cliff and perished in the waters. What delight did the Lord get out of seeing those pigs perishing in the waters? There was a reason. It was to convince these two men that the demons had actually gone out of them. You know, when you say to somebody, the, to the demons be gone, well, other people can say and see the changed behavior in these people, but how are these people themselves to know immediately? How could they know immediately the demons are gone? Is it by a certain calmness that came into their mind right then? Well, they may have had occasional periods of calmness even before. I've seen demon-possessed people who look perfectly normal sometimes. They get all worked up sometimes, I've seen, after a Christian meeting or when a man with authority comes to them. Otherwise, they are calm. Think of all the demon-possessed people who sat in the synagogues in Jesus' time. They were not creating a ruckus and a confusion there when all the Pharisees were speaking. The Pharisees had been speaking there for years, and these demon-possessed people sat comfortably there in those synagogues. But the moment Jesus came in, oh, those demons got worked up. They had been sitting there for years, but they got worked up because Jesus had come. And so, uh, calmness in a person does not always indicate he is not demon-possessed. So, how would these people know that the demons had gone? Just a little bit of calmness? Well, they had periods of calmness before. So, the Lord, to help them to know that the demons had gone, they heard the demons from within them asking Jesus for permission, please allow us to go into the swine. And the Lord gave them that permission. It's almost as though he answered the prayer of these demons for the sake of these two human beings. And the demons went into the swine, and when the two human beings, who had these people who were demon-possessed, saw the pigs falling into the water, they said, wow, they're gone. I, I know they're gone. I saw them in getting into the swine, and I saw the swine falling over the water. And we read here, the herdsmen ran away, the people who were looking after the swine, went into the city and reported. It's very interesting to see there, uh, verse 33, how it's recorded. The herdsmen, that is the people who were looking after the swine, ran away when they saw the pigs all jumped into the sea and reported. Now, notice, read carefully, exactly what they reported. First of all, everything. And as it were in brackets, including the incident of the demoniacs. In other words, the main thing they reported, which they felt was the most important thing that happened that day, was we lost the pigs. And second, postscript. One of the unimportant things that happened, by the way, folks, is that those two demon-possessed people seem to be okay now. They're sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him. Now, which was more important in the mind of those herdsmen? Clear, the loss of the pigs. That was everything. And the other, the deliverance of the demon demoniacs, was sort of a postscript added at the end of the message. Is that how it is with us? Does loss of property mean more to us or people delivered from the power of Satan? For many Christians, if you examine your life, you'll find that loss of your property disturbs you more than people who are in the grip of the, of the devil himself. That is what the Lord wants, to deliver, wants us to have a priority for, deliverance of people. Jesus did not come to protect us from loss of material things. He came to deliver people from the power of Satan. And it says here, when the people in the city heard it, their mind mindset was exactly the same. These were, you know, some type of Jewish people. Their mindsets were exactly the same. And for them also, the pigs were more important than two human beings. Two thousand pigs, Jesus said, showed were not as important as two human beings. 
And we read here in verse 34, the whole city came to meet Jesus. And when they came, they entreated him to depart from their region. One would have thought they'd be excited. Hey, this is wonderful. These two human beings who were possessed by demons for so long are finally delivered. Praise God. No, their mindset was 2,000 pigs have been lost. And this man was the cause of this loss. Let's drive him out of here before we lose more material things. We're not bothered about demon-possessed people here. There could have been other demon-possessed people in the, in the town, in that area. But they were not bothered about them. What a commentary on the state of affairs with many who were Bible-believing people over here. Well, whenever people told Jesus they didn't want him, he always left. He didn't sort of force himself in any place. It says here, chapter 9, verse 1, he got into a boat and crossed over and came to his own city, which is Capernaum. It's a very sad thing that many people choose material blessing over spiritual blessing. And if there's got to be a sacrifice of something material in order to get that spiritual blessing, they say, we don't want it. And it amounts to driving Jesus away. I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about Christians who seek for material profit more than spiritual blessing. That's the message here in this story. These people from that city, from the whole area of Gadara, they were more interested in their business than in the deliverance of human beings from the devil's power. And lots and lots of Christians are like that. Deliverance of people from Satan's power ranks very low in their order of priorities. Making money, having plenty of pigs, is more important to them. Are these people believers? Are they following Jesus? Or they are following these blind people of Gadara? But Jesus won't force himself. You remember that verse in Revelation 3.20. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I come in. What if someone doesn't open the door? He doesn't come in. And I'm not referring to just receiving Christ into our heart. Allowing him to come to areas of our life, which may not be demon-possessed, but where there's an influence of Satan in our life. Do you watch pornography? That's not demon possession. But there's tremendous demonic influence there which is affecting your mind. Allowing you to make choices when you go to the computer. To look at scenes that you could never sit watching if Christ was sitting beside you. Anything that you do, which you cannot do if Jesus were sitting next to you, you know there's something wrong in that. There's something sinful about that. However much you may justify yourself. The things you do in your financial transactions, the books you read, the music you listen to, the DVDs you watch, the movies you watch. Can you have Jesus there with you while doing that? If not, that is an area of your life that Satan has some control over, even though you may not be demon-possessed. He has some influence into that life through your flesh, through the dirty desires in your heart. He has influence in those areas. And those areas are the areas where you'll have confusion. Because the Lord will not enter an area of your life which you do not permit him. And when you say, Lord, I don't want you to interfere in what I'm watching on the computer. I don't want you to stop me from watching certain movies. I don't want to wa stop you from, I don't want you to stop me from reading certain books. The Lord will say, fine. I'm not going to stop you. Just go and do right what you like. And he will get into a boat and depart. Because you don't want him in that area of your life. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the reason why Satan can create so much confusion in the lives of many believers. Let me take an impression, uh, the, let me take an example of an umbrella. If it is raining, if you completely stand under an umbrella, a big umbrella, no part of your body will get wet. But if you put only part of your body under that umbrella, the part that's outside will get wet. It's like that. When you give yourself to Christ, Christ offers a total protection for our whole being. But if I offer only part of it to him, it's only that part that's protected. And the other part gets affected by the devil. He can bring sickness. He can bring confusion. 
He can bring all types of problems. How safe it is to be completely under Christ. Turn in Matthew chapter 9, it says, They were bringing to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Take courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. What can we learn from here? What did Jesus teach through this? What Jesus taught through this is that if you can't have faith, somebody else's faith can also help you. It doesn't say the paralytic had faith. The people who brought him, the very action of bringing that paralytic to Jesus was an act of faith. And he said to them, take courage. He said to them, paralytic, take courage, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Before he healed him, he forgave his sins. He said, you know there's a bigger problem with you than paralysis, your sin. You need to understand that even if you're paralyzed, the bigger problem is sin. Here they bring a paralytic man to Jesus. And seeing the faith of those people, those people who brought this paralytic man, he doesn't heal the paralytic first. He says, your sins are forgiven. I'll do for you what is most important. And some of them were thinking, the Bible scholars, this fellow blasphemes because they think, how can a man forgive sins? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, it's amazing when you walk with God, the Lord allows you even sometimes to know what people are thinking in their mind while you're speaking. While you're preaching, the Lord can give you discernment and say, this is what people are thinking right now. What he did for Jesus, he'll do for you. Jesus knew their thoughts and said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? Now you may say it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Well, as words go, that's right. But it costs far more for Christ to forgive our sin than to heal our sickness. He didn't have to die on the cross to heal our sickness. God could speak a word from heaven and heal everybody's sickness. It is more difficult to have our sin forgiven, but those people didn't understand that. But he said, in order to prove to you that the Son of Man has got authority on earth to forgive sin, he said to the paralytic, rise up, take up your bed and walk. He rose up and went home. There we read that Jesus' action of forgiving his sin was attested by God. You know, many of the miracles that Jesus did were an attestation by God of his ministry and his spoken word. I want to show you a verse in Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2, in the very first sermon that Jesus preached, and that Peter preached, sorry. He said, Acts chapter 2, verse 22 Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. See, the miracles were an attestation of Jesus' ministry. And that's why we read here that the Son of Man, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He made the person get up and walk and he went away. And the multitude saw this and were filled with awe. Matthew 9, verse 8. They glorified God who had given such authority to men. Praise the Lord. There's something we can learn from every single action and word that Jesus spoke. He's taught by his life and by his words. We'll continue in our next episode.